Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day just to be alive, courtesy of your grace. We thank you for thinking of us. We thank you for the gift of life and eternal life. We ask that you help us always give you all the credit and glory for this thing that we sometimes get so used to. Father, most of all, we're grateful that you sent your son down to earth to become one of us so that he could take our place on the cross once for all 2,000 years ago, paying for the sins of the entire world. Father, we ask that you bless this message, that you guide us, help us open our ears and our hearts to what your message is this evening. And we ask these things in Christ's precious name, and it's by the power of your Spirit, we pray. Amen. Why the Apostles So Encouraging, By Grace They Were Prepared, Part 65. So first off, this came up on uh, Sunday, and this was also in our prayer that we just opened with. What greater example of power is there than the actual giving of life? And talk about something we take for granted because we're so used to it. But what greater example of power is there to, get, to give something dead life? Something that, you know, <laughs> like God used the dirt, the dust of the ground, right? To make Adam. Something with zero life in it to give it life. Obviously only he could do that, and that, that is a, the greatest example of power we could probably think of. And I was thinking about this the other night. I was outside uh, on a clear night, kind of looking up at the stars and, you know, <laughs> taking in that perspective, which we are so busy we forget to stop and take that perspective in. Um, the Lord gave us all life at birth. And I was thinking, why did he even think of me and let me be born? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but why? Why does my soul even exist right now? Totally out of love, grace, mercy, but also power. He says it and he, he does it. And that goes for every single person alive right now or who's ever lived a total grace gift done by the omnipotent power of God. So life is a miracle that we're way too familiar with. And even how that came about, we're way too familiar with. We take life itself for granted when it's really the greatest miracle of all. As we even see animals moving around and making decisions of their own, animating their way around life, around this world, etc., we lose sight that it's a miracle that these things are even living at all and breathing and, and uh, you know, reproducing and eating and planting even, like hibernating in the winter. These things are alive, and we're so familiar with it because since the day we were born, that's all we see, right? But how foolish to be familiar with that miracle and that power of God. And then the power of God provides eternal life, too, to those who humbly believe in his Son. Think about this. God has the power to make a hopeless, reprobate sinner who is under the condemnation of death. He has the power to make them born again. Someone hopeless, someone uh, beyond repair, there's no fixing. He has the power to make them born again. Again, making a dead person alive, something only he can do. By the word of his power, the believer is born of the Spirit, which we saw on Sunday. And he's made into a new supernatural creature, possessing the very righteousness of Christ himself. Brand new. Something only possible by the mercy and power of God, according to 1 Peter 1.3 on the board. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. I just love that phrase, he's caused us to be born again. He's caused us. He made it happen. And that phrase, I, I was just looking up the Greek before class out of curiosity, that phrase has caused us to be born again is all one Greek word. And it's only used one time in the Bible. 
and it's in the active voice and the aorist tense. It's God saying, right now at this moment, for example, when someone believes in Christ, I'm going to cause you to be gone again. I'm going to do it actively. All on him, all his power. Zero of man's power. So what a cool thing to fall back on, that it's all God, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Jesus himself proclaimed this, as we know, uh, that those who trust in him are born again. Turn again in your Bibles to John 3, verse 1. John 3, verse 1. We were talking on Sunday about, you know, human power versus divine power. How impossible these things are with man by the power of man. But how easy they are for the power of God. Look at John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, human rationalism and human power cannot and did not grasp what Jesus said here. And it sounds like nonsense if you're looking at it from the human perspective. It sounds, it doesn't make any sense at all from the flesh's perspective. But we believers, those who have surrendered to Christ finally, some of you may have taken decades, maybe some of you did it as a child, but when you finally surrendered to Christ, God opened up your eyes. The Spirit made it click for you. What does this, you know, born again even mean? That it's totally a work of God, a work of the Spirit that is given to us by faith in Christ. And as Pastor mentioned this on Sunday a bit, I'll often, I'll often have people ask me, once a conversation about God has started, are you born again? And even though they're trying to be polite when they say it, there's a little bit of a mocking tone to it. And why is that? It's because that doesn't make sense to them, first of all. Why this born again thing? What the heck does that even mean? They might not say those words, but that's what they're thinking because they're used to religion. See, in religion, I know my way. I know my boundaries. If I do this, this, and this, I'm good with God, or at least I think I am. At least I'm not as bad as some other people, etc. So it's, it's in the known for the flesh, so to speak. But being born again, that's like a foreign spiritual idea. And that's why it uh, scares people. So they'll ask, you know, are, are you a born again? To try to fit me into whichever category, you know, as we're talking about God here. Which one are you? Where are you from? And um, to them, it's, it's foolishness, right? The gospel's foolishness to those who are perishing. But they don't realize, not reading their Bibles, that Jesus himself said being born again is a requirement to see the kingdom of God. And that turns the whole conversation upside down, if you think about it. I'm sure you've, you've probably done this in the past yourself, is if that topic comes up, being born again, hey, listen, I know that might seem weird to you, or you might not understand it, but I'm not saying you have to be born again. Jesus said you have to be born again. You can't even see the kingdom of God. So now you put it on him, you see? You take it off yourself. It's not you claiming this strange religion. You put it on Christ and his words and let them contend with Christ in their soul. And God will work on them. But again, as we see here in this verse, it's Jesus that said this phrase that nobody really wants to hear because it's an unknown. It's too spiritual. Look at John 3, 3 again. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? 
He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So there we see the failure of human power to rationalize supernatural things. He's trying to look at it logically instead of spiritually. And if it doesn't fit into his understanding, his human understanding, it's easily cast off. So Nicodemus is not really seeking or looking at it spiritually or seeking the ways of God. And that's an Achilles heel of religion. That's what religion does because it wants control. It wants to fit into a box. It wants to know what he can do, know what I can do to satisfy God. And if I don't know, I'm uncomfortable. But God's ways are not our ways. So Nicodemus is, is relying on human power here and not open to spiritual things. So Jesus said to him in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? At this point, it should sound like some conversations you've had with religious people in your life. How can it be so simple? How can these things be? Don't you have to be a good person to go to heaven? And technically, the answer is yes, but you have to be perfect. The Bible says no man can be good enough not even one. So now what? Now what? If I have to be perfect and I can't be, and even as good as I might think I am, I know I can't be perfect. Now what's left? Well, you must be born again. In other words, the first one is so bad that it can't be fixed. And God says, I'm not even going to mess around with that. I'm not even going to let you be involved in that. Other than faith, through faith, I'm going to release to you a give to you this new creature that can't fail anymore. And that's why heaven's going to be heaven when we get there. Because we can't sin anymore in the new nature. So we have a new nature of God given to us when we're born again. The first one can't is hopeless, can't be fixed. We need a brand new one, and it has to be from God alone. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. See, at this point, Jesus said this to Nicodemus before the cross. So even Old Testament believers were under the ground in paradise right now. So literally, no one, not even Moses or Abraham, had ascended to heaven yet. It wasn't possible for man yet. So Jesus again said, no one has ascended into heaven, but he, talking about himself, who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Now we see Jesus elaborating on how one can be born again. And I'll be honest with you, for years, I was a little bit confused as a believer. On what does it mean to be born again? How do I know if I'm born again? You know the reason I was confused? I wasn't reading my Bible in context. But if you keep reading, what are we reading right now in John chapter 3? We're reading the same conversation with Nicodemus that started in verse 1 or verse 3 about being born again. So Jesus goes on to say, whoever believes in verse 15 will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him 
shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light, Jesus talking about himself, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So again, the Spirit has been emphasizing the power of the Word of God, including the power of being born again by God's Word. As came up on Sunday on the board, the power of the Word, by its or His power, the Word is Jesus Christ, they're one and the same, by its power the heavens and the earth were made, and it upholds the very laws of science, created every creature ever known to man, has breathed life into every living thing there ever was. That's the power of the Word that we take for granted. But that's how easy it is for God. There's a verse in the Old Testament where it says God spread apart, spread, spread across uh, the universe, spread the stars out with this pinky finger. Could there be a greater illustration of how easy it is for God? That's his power. And that's what we believers rely on for salvation, right? Isn't that why we're, we can be so confident in salvation? Because it's this God that, that said and spoke these things and they happened. And he also said, if you believe in me, you have eternal life, etc., etc. But religious people, they choose to rely on self for salvation. We've talked about this um, last week, I think, too. How all world religions, other than true Christianity, are all about self somehow appeasing God or earning a better eternal status. Every single religion is about man and his own ability to, you know, meet some kind of a standard. And only true Christianity is about the inability of man to meet God's standard. And that only by God's grace can man be saved. So there's freedom. But people in religion are in bondage, whether they realize it or not. And unbelievers also forget or refuse to acknowledge that same word of God also holds the power to destroy and judge at the appropriate time. People don't want to hear this. They turn a you know, deaf ear to it. Like, no, no, God's love. He doesn't judge. He doesn't have to judge. And they don't take Scripture in context. They don't even look at Scripture. But they don't look at the whole of it, the whole story of the gospel, so to speak. So turn again to 2 Thessalonians 2.8. The fact is God's going to grant people what they want because of free will. He's not going to force anyone to be with him for all eternity. He's not going to force anyone to accept his son. And the only alternative is judgment, which is not being with God for all eternity, which is horrible because God is everything good. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. <laughs> Didn't he have to speak a word, right? The breath of his mouth. The Antichrist is defeated. That is, the one who is coming in, is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. What's the problem with unbelievers? They rejected the good news. They rejected the light, Jesus Christ. They rejected the very love of God. And that's why there's a judgment for them. 
by their own choice. But this judgment is why every man should fear God rightly. This is the God that has the power to cast into hell or the power to save. So it's appropriate to have a fear, the, the right fear, the, one, the only one to really fear would be God himself. Because by the word of his power, all these things come to pass. So on Sunday, we were asked to reflect on power and how we perceive it in our lives. And pastor asked us to think about the things that we fear even. And not just what we fear, but why we fear them. And what's our motivation, right? What's the, what's the root concern in certain fears? What we really fear is a lack of power or being powerless. That was kind of the conclusion the Spirit brought out on Sunday. Being powerless. We fear not having the power to do certain things. Uh, for example, to save ourselves from pain or danger or poverty or whatever, whatever it is that kind of, you know, haunts your flesh. We fear not being in control. Is that why we're all control freaks? Because we fear not having the power within ourselves to save ourselves? And if you think about it, it's a legitimate fear for the flesh. It's true. You can't save yourself. You wonder why you have fears of being powerless? Because ultimately, we are all powerless. And man's only solution and hope is to give it up. Give it up to God who loves us and died for us and has the power to save us and to keep us. This is what religious people don't see. They're blinded. It's like scales over the eyes. And for now, they're not meant to see it yet. Maybe they're not ready yet. We'll talk about that as we close tonight. But only the Lord has the power to save us and keep us. And religious people, all of us at some point in our lives, have to give it up. On the board, man's only hope is to throw his reliance upon the only, the, the only one who can and does save, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's man's only hope. To take it off himself that self-reliance thing, and literally cast it from him onto Jesus Christ. Remember repenting, like turning away from sin and self and turning to Christ? Remember that? That's sort of like a picture of salvation. Well, there's a certain throwing away of your self-reliance. At some point, you have to give it up, realize it's hopeless, and cast it upon the only one who can save you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to John 6, verse 35. John 6, 35. So this takes giving up on our own power because it's futile anyway. It's not real power. And trusting in the one that has true power. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Do you remember how the people were startled at the authority Jesus spoke with? Why could he speak with such authority? What, look at the words. Why does he say, how can he say, whoever comes to me will not hunger? Whoever believes in me will never thirst. How can he say that? Well, he speaks with such authority because he has the power to back it up. He has true power. He has power as the, as the Son of God to do whatever he says without a hitch, without even the challenges of Satan himself. Cannot be stopped. So Jesus spoke in this way, and that's what startled or even stunned the people of his day. Uh, so hold your thumb here in John 6 and turn to Mark 1, verse 21. Mark 1, 21. 
Again, the Lord had the power. He's the only one with the power to back everything up he said by the word of his power. Easy for God. Mark 1.21 They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Now notice the word of his power. Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. So throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands, by his word, right? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Why? They have to obey him. Why? It's the word of his power. You can't really explain it, but that's God's power. So a new, new teaching with authority, he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So he spoke with one who had authority, and he followed up on it every time. So go back to John 6.35. So let that kind of be a reminder as we read this passage again of why Jesus is so um, dogmatic in his speech and why he can be so dogmatic in his speech. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. How can he say that? Because he has the power to keep you? It's easy for him? For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him on the last day. You've heard the expression, his words as good as gold. But truly, we can't say that about any man 100%. Even though, thank God, there are some men with integrity that we deal with in the world, right, that we, we trust them, and we might say this about them. But is any man perfect? No. Is Jesus perfect? Of course. Everything he says has to come true because of who he is, because he has perfect power. So Jesus spoke so confidently because he had the power to fulfill the promises he was stating. So, again, this came up on Sunday. Why do we have fears? Why do we have nightmares even? Because we're relying on our own power. And deep down, we know it won't be sufficient. You could be the strongest person, You could be strong compared to other people. It could be mentally, physically, even spiritually, I suppose. We don't want to compare ourselves to other people, but you might think you have a certain level of power. And, you know, especially when things are going well, when you're not straying too much, you know, you're following God, you're being faithful, and you get a little bit of a big head. But there's always that time when it turns around, when you struggle, when you fail, and deep down every man knows his power is not sufficient to keep himself holy, for example. His power is not enough. Maybe that's one reason for things like nightmares. I don't know. But maybe God is showing us we will fail if we keep relying on self to save self. 
Well, Pastor mentioned this on Sunday, and it's so true. Um, I think everyone's had that dream where someone's trying to kill you, and even though they're, they're right on your back, just about to catch you, you're still running in mud, so to speak. You're in slow motion, right? Why? Why do we have that dream? Why is it so consistent? Maybe that's God's grace showing every man he can't save himself by himself. Who knows? I don't know. But God uses all these things for good, you know, for those that love him. Maybe he's showing man you've got to look up for help. No matter how self-sufficient you, you think you are, or how strong you think you are. So our conclusion on Sunday was this on the board regarding power and fear. Whatever your fears or nightmares in life, they revolve around being powerless to save yourself and others you love. Only trusting in the power of the word can quell the fears of any man. And it's because nothing is impossible with him. Only trusting in the word, the power of the word, can dispel our fear, fears, make them go poof, right? Only trusting in the power of the word, which is the power of Jesus himself, will let those fears dissipate. And the great irony is we have all power when we drop our own attempts to control power or to keep our own power. Right? Don't we have access to all power when we drop our own way, our own reliance, self-reliance, and we rely on him? Don't we now have access to all power? Pretty ironic. And we are trying to hold on, you know, as tight as we can to our own power so that we're not out of control ever. And we're holding on to something that's powerless. And God's like, I'll literally give you all power at your fingertips by faith if you choose to have faith. On the board, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How can we have such confidence in our abilities as believers in Christ, no matter what we're facing? How can, how can you have an unshakable confidence in the face of death even, or in the face of losing everything? How can you still have a peace and know that if God wants to, he can turn it around like this. How can you have that confidence? Well, if the Lord can give you life and make you born again from a place of death, he can certainly save you daily, sanctify you. He can certainly rescue you from any temporary earthly situation, right? Right? Are we, are we so lacking in faith? Remember Jesus said that to the apostles? Oh, ye of little faith. Are we so lacking in faith that we don't trust that he can like totally <laughs> give us a brand new life in the middle of our life, so to speak? Turn things around on, on, a, on a dime if, if it's his will? So we trust in him daily. The righteous man walks by faith. Why not trust him for that if, he, if we already trusted him with the greatest thing, eternal life? Turn again to Matthew 19, verse 23. We can be so foolish. So just another reminder, when we, when we give it up, we literally have access to all power. So says God. Matthew 19, 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible, but with God... All things are possible. If God can save someone that's totally helpless, as hopeless as making it through the eye of a needle, 
That's hopeless, right? Doesn't get any more impossible than that in terms of man's understanding. Then he can save you from any hopeless situation in this world. If God wants to heal Bill from his cancer tomorrow, then it's done, right? And are we, um, do we as believers give up hope? Should we give up hope that he might decide to do that? Or should we pray? Be like, Lord, you know, that'd be pretty cool if you showed us a miracle and saved a couple people along the way. But your will be done. But do we doubt that he can do that? May it never be. He does it all the time. So let us pray, right? Another message we receive from the Spirit is that salvation is a miracle. Salvation from sin and death reveals the very power of God. Again, he's taking a spiritually dead person and making him alive forevermore in a perfect state through faith by grace. Go again to Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. Salvation is a miracle, and if you can do that, everything else is lesser. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, there's the power of God. That was cool. The building shook for those of you online who don't know what happened. The wind just uh, shook us up a little bit. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. If God's power didn't decide to do it, then you can believe all you want. It's not going to get done. But the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. On Sunday, we also discussed the deception that those stuck in religion find themselves in. And our best example of this, especially in our area, is the Roman Catholic Church. And we're speaking objectively here today. We're not, you know, we're not um, being emotional about this or whatever. We're just talking about the facts or the doctrines that they believe in. They take the fact that God has certain commands for us, such as the Ten Commandments, and impose that upon salvation as though that's the way to be saved. So this is what religions tend to do. There has to be some involvement by man, some credit for man. But that's not in the Bible. And they take a religious obedience for these commands as their way to earning God's favor, which is the same mistake the Pharisees made. The Pharisees took pride in keeping the law, but why were they keeping it? to earn their way with God. A mistake, right? Motivation's everything. Why do we do what we do? I mean, we're supposed to obey, right? Obey God's commands. But that's out of love for Him, out of gratitude for Him. It's not out of er uh, an earning, an attempt to earn and create our own righteousness. But that's what religion does. And if one would just read his own Bible in context, instead of blindly following the doctrines of his religion, he would see that salvation is only possible by the grace of God. Read your Bible, right? Most of you know this, I know. But who knows who's listening? Who, know, who knows who you have to share this with? Read your Bible. Come to your own conclusion. Just read the Gospel of John. Read something in context. Come to your own conclusion. Salvation is only possible by the grace of God, according to the scriptures. The commands, the law was given to show that we couldn't keep it. Not perfectly. And so we're in big trouble without the grace of God. 
But because most Catholics won't seek God on their own, and they willingly follow blindly, and I know, I was one of them, they willingly follow blindly. You mean I don't have to think for myself? That's right. That's right, son. Just go. Just come to church. You'll be, you'll be good. We'll tell you what you need to hear. Don't read your own Bible. We'll tell you what you need to hear. So, literally, it is a willing, <laughs> blind following of... It's not how God meant it to be. God looks at the heart. He wants you to seek Him, according to the Word. But religion sets things up in a way where you don't have to seek Him. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, God loves you. Don't worry about it. There's no judgment in the end. If there is, it's only for the really bad people. So there it is. It's easy, right? I don't have to think. I don't have to, you know, be accountable to God. I can just blindly follow. But the result of that is anxiety and confusion about salvation, especially when people get older for example, or get sick. They don't realize the word says they are required to be perfect to go to heaven with God. Because they don't, they don't go into the word. So what do they do? They seek to justify themselves, not realizing the hopelessness of that, and not admitting that they're stuck in the throes of sin without any power to redeem themselves. Powerless. But religion makes it quote-unquote easy. As a former Catholic, I understand where they're coming from, being taught to rely on self and my own goodness to satisfy God. And as a former Catholic, I also know what it's like to come to a point of realization that there must be another way. Thank God, by the grace of God, he had me come to the end of it one day. There must be another way. What's the way? And then by the grace of God, the Spirit shined His light on my heart and soul one day with Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And it's up to each person whether they want to seek, want to ask. And it's from God. God the Father draws every man but free will is also involved. Someone has to, whoever they are, whoever's religious, has to come to a point where they admit they can't save themselves. They're powerless to determine what happens after death, for example. But He is the hope. Jesus is the hope to be saved, period. The only hope. And that's why Jesus said in John 13, 38, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Crystal clear, if you read your Bible. And then there's the fabrication of a place called purgatory. Now think about, think about the ingenious schemes of Satan. The fabrication of a place called purgatory. Just in case you're not good enough, don't worry. There's a fallback place so you don't have to go to hell. What a... <laughs> oh, he's so evil. Let me deceive people, not only into thinking they can earn their way to, to heaven, but that just in case, don't worry, there's a, there's a fallback. So live for yourself. And don't really, don't worry about surrendering to Christ. You don't really need to. He's there for you. You don't really need to trust in him to save you. You're good. You're going to make it. And then even if you're not good enough, you know, enjoy your life. God wants you to enjoy your life after all, right? There's a fallback, purgatory. It's not that bad even. Someone's going to pray you out. Someone's going to give enough money to get you out. Hopefully your relatives will give enough money to get you out. How ingenious is Satan's schemes? Our Satan's schemes. Let people think they'll at least be okay one way or another. That there really is no place called hell to fear or only really bad people go there and you're not one of them. 
Holy Scripture says anyone who doesn't repent and turn to Christ alone for salvation has chosen the destiny of hell for themselves. But religion won't tell people that. They want people to keep coming back and put their dollar in the bucket. As sad as that sounds, it's true. The deception of religion. This is the way religion works, creating things not found in the Word of God, like purgatory, to simply appease the people. Or to not, you know, allow people to have proper fear of God. This is the way religion works, creating things not found in the Word of God. Purgatory is just one example to simply appease the people. The greatest legitimate fear for man should be spending eternity in a place called hell. And Satan would rather you think it doesn't even exist. So you don't seek God in his salvation. Why do you need salvation if there's no place such as hell? Or everyone goes to heaven. Or there's purgatory as my backup. What do I need to be saved from? I'm going to make myself anyway. I'm better than most. Meanwhile, you're judging people all the time in your head. I'm better than most. Meanwhile, you slander people behind their back all the time, which God considers like murder in God's eyes. But you're better than most. And we all have a little religion in us, remember, right? We've, all, we've been taught that for a while. Don't be on guard for your hearts. Don't think it can't even creep back in, because it does at different times, especially when you're vulnerable or you're weak or you're tired. So hell is more than real, according to Jesus himself. In Matthew 24, 51, there's, it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Mark 9, 48, where the worm or the conscience does not die, and the fire is not quenched. And in Revelation 21.8, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And there's much more. So listen up. If a person believes the false gospel of Roman Catholicism as their gospel, okay, if they personally believe it, and that's what they believe, relying on the goodness of self instead of relying on the goodness of Christ, then they're unsaved even though they might use the name of Jesus. Now, each man's individual. Each, God knows the heart. Who knows what someone believes in their heart? It's really between them and God. But if all they believe is the false gospel of Roman Catholicism and they're relying on the goodness of themselves instead of, it's one or the other, instead of relying on the goodness of Christ to save them, they're unsaved, even though they use the name of Jesus. Lord, Lord, right? Didn't we do this in your name? I never knew you. It's either trust in self for one's own salvation, which is ultimately the Catholic way to be saved, or to trust in Christ alone as your Savior, the only way according to Jesus himself. So on the board, a personal trust in Jesus Christ alone as one's Lord and Savior is the only way one can have peace with regards to his eternal destiny. And I know most of you know this, so are listening to my voice right now, but this is for you to share, maybe. This is, these are the messages we need to carry on to religious people we know and to be crystal clear about certain things, like our own sinfulness, like our hopelessness, like our powerlessness, whether they, whether they accept it or not. These are the things we have to pass on and be, you know, tell the truth in love. Be honest with them. A personal trust in Jesus Christ alone as one, one's Lord and Savior is the only way one can have peace with regards to his eternal destiny. Otherwise, you're going to be nervous and confused and anxious till the day you die because you're not sure if your own power is going to get you there or not. You're not sure if you're good enough. So are you willing to give it up, unbeliever? Are you willing to drop that stupid, arrogant self-reliance and say, all right, 
I'm going to throw it on Christ. I'm going to rely on him fully for my salvation. Go to, uh, actually don't go there, but <laughs> I meant speaking in general. If you want to see this for yourselves, whoever you are, go to Acts 16, 31, John 10, 27 through 30, and 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Just to name a few. But most religious people, they live in fear of hell. They have an, a haunting uncertainty that gets worse and worse as they get older because they're not sure if they're really good enough. The unbeliever's way is destined to fail because they are depending upon their own human power to justify themselves to the degree of godly righteousness. Just think about how foolish that statement is. That I can make myself righteous enough to be, for God to be happy with me. And God's perfect. Even logically, that doesn't make sense. But, you know, we rationalize. We love to rationalize. We love to compare ourselves to others. We should be comparing ourselves to God and saying, whoa, I have no chance. But no, we compare ourselves to others. We're told what we want to hear at religious churches. So we just go on with our lives. But ultimately, people will fear their eternal destiny if they're stuck in religion. The true believer, the one who doesn't just use Jesus' name in a religious way, but has personally repented of his sinfulness and trusted in Christ to save him, he has the peace of God, knowing who his salvation's from. That's the only way to have the peace of God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 1, verse 3, as we close. 1 Peter 1, 3. Here's the perspective of someone who has and knows the gospel of Jesus Christ and has trusted in Him, has given up on self and trusted in Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So there's the joy and peace that we as believers have. There's, there's what we lean on, the power of the word to do the things that he said he's going to do for those who believe. So we must pray for those trapped in religion. In fact, that's the very best thing we can do is pray. Pray for those trapped in religion. Because only God can change a person's heart. You can't. I can't. I had to come to this as an evangelist. I can't persuade people. It was foolish for me to think I could persuade people into believing. My job is to give the truth freely, right, out of love all of our jobs, and to let God go to work because only God can change the heart. Out of pride and stubbornness, religious people don't realize the good news that they're denying, at least not yet. We are not to give up hope, folks. You know, it's real easy to give up hope on people that we've witnessed to more than once, that, you know, are even violent against you, at least in words. 
it's real easy to give up hope as though God can't break them. Their free will is still involved, but God knows how to get to each individual person and quote-unquote break their heart. So our job is not to give up hope. We should be praying and praying and praying for our loved ones, for our friends, for those that we've come in contact with in the past that said no to the gospel. We should just be praying and lay it all on him because he has the power to accomplish salvation in an unbeliever, i.e. you and I. He got us, right, at some point. Why do we think it's impossible for him to get so-and-so who's just a stubborn, you know, whatever he is? You fill in the blank. So our job is to not give up hope. So I'm going to close with this. All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. It's easy to lose hope for certain people, people that we know are stubborn and set in their ways. But I'm going to give you one example. Who was more stubborn and set in his ways than Saul of Tarsus? Who was more wicked of a man than Saul of Tarsus? And yet at the right time, the Lord knocked him off his high horse and showed himself to him. The Lord showed himself to him very clearly in Acts chapter 9. So, again, our job is not to give up hope. On the contrary, we never give up hope. That's what believers do because we have Christ and we know the power of Christ. So we never give up hope. And it's the Lord's timing and power that can reach anyone. Say it with me. Anyone. Anyone. Is anyone hopeless? We've got to have the right attitude as believers because we believe in the power of God, don't we? Or don't, do we not? So it's the Lord's timing and power that can reach anyone. And we continue to pray and be, be available to possibly plant a seed about the true gospel and watch the Spirit of Jesus go to work in them. End of story. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your word, the power of your word, and that whatever you speak, it is so. We thank you for causing us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we thank you that you have many more planned to be saved, even in our own lives. And we ask that you help us contribute, help us be part of it, just out of pure privilege and gratitude for the gospel. Not out of earning our way or persuading anybody, but we ask for the privilege to be a part of your marvelous salvation plan for those in our periphery. And Father, we ask that you free those who are trapped in religion, those in our lives that are stubborn and relying on self. Show them what they need to see. Have them hear what they need to hear as only you can get to them. And we thank you in advance for answering our prayers. We ask that you give us the strength and faith and courage to go out to a lost and dying world that needs this truth so desperately. It's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your Spirit. Amen.